Oh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a joint program of the Palisades, Orangeburg, and Tapan Libraries. And we are very pleased to welcome Tony Bracco from Bracco Farms. And he has a, an excellent presentation for us on gardening. So, welcome, Tony. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me on this beautiful day this morning. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about uh, starting out your own victory garden um, and in your backyard. Maybe some of you already are gardeners and probably are not beginners and some are beginners, some have no experience, I'm sure. And what I'm gonna do is try to take you uh, by showing, uh, I divide my talks into three parts, but I'm showing some basic uh, gardening uh, styles uh, from every raised bed to open bed, square foot terracing, samples of each one. Then I will go into where to source seeds and where to source fertilizers, what to plant, how to plant it, and so on. So that's what I'm going to, to be talking about today. Um, a little background about myself. I'm a, by vocation, I'm a graphic designer. By avocation, I'm a farmer. Uh, I was an avid gardener for many, many years until 12 years ago when we bought a farm in, in, in uh, Warwick, New York, in the Black Dirt region of Pine Island. And we have been farming every uh, spring and summer since then. And we've built up a nice uh, group of clients and uh, we have a lot of fun with it. It was never intended to be a business, but it kind of morphed into that. So we're just going with it. So, uh, so what I'm going to do today is what we've learned on the farm can be also adapted for working in a garden and vice versa. A lot of the tools that we use at the farm are hand tools and some of them are not readily available in your garden center or your uh, Home Depot or Lowe's type stores, but I'll show you where to source them and they're no more expensive than if you got them there. So we're gonna start by showing the different types of gardens. I'm going to show pictures uh, hopefully we can get this thing where I can get them larger, but we'll, we'll do the best we can. Uh, we're going to start with what's called an open plan garden. So I have a picture here of it. Um, can everybody see it? Everybody see the photo? Yeah, okay. So this is what's called an open plan. An open plan is simple, is a simple, the simplest rudimentary type garden you can have. So it's really just create this planting right in the, in the soil, making some basic paths through it. Uh, this garden here it has a lot of peas and beans growing, climbing, so they put a lot of trellises to hold everything up. And again, it's very basic. Um, the problem with this is you'll have a lot of problems with runoff, with, with storms, with water uh, erosion, and you really can't contain it because it's an open plan. Um, I do have another picture of a more involved open plan, and I think yeah. this is a nice one. Uh, this one shows... Um, in between the, where they've grown everything, they put some straw down and it looks like grass cuttings to make <coughs> paths. And it's great for weed suppression. And it also makes definition between the crops that you're growing. And they put a small fence around it. Um, this fence, unfortunately, won't keep out many pests. It may keep out um, some, some rabbits and chipmunks, but it's not really gonna stop groundhogs or deer. But yet I think it's just a border to define the space and it works nicely. Uh, the most common type of garden is raised beds. Ra raised bed gardening is uh, my preferred method of gardening, and that's what I had when I had my garden. Um, the nice thing about raised beds is it makes, you can define the space by having a border around it. And the border does, is wonderful because what it does is it keeps all the soil in. So if there's going to be a storm, a rainstorm, you won't have any runoff, you won't have any erosion because everything will be contained in, in the, uh, within the boards, within the frame. And the nice thing about it too, is it'll stop some small pests from getting in, you know, maybe chipmunks and groundhogs. They, of course they can climb in, but to burrow it through, it'll be good. And nice thing about it too, creates a nice defined space. And it, I always recommend spacing the boxes about two feet apart. So this way you can get wagons in. Some people like to put, uh, uh, to, instead of mulch like this is and wood shavings, they'll, they'll put grass and then you can, at least the mower can pass through. Uh, so you want to get, be able to get in and out with wheelbarrow. So if you have to bring any fertilizer in or you want to bring any topsoil in, it's easy to work and you can get through it. And it also makes for a really nice appearance. Um, another photo of it would be 
this second raised bed photo, which is more, much more involved. Um, this person here has made the boxes very high and you can go higher with the boxes. Um, it, it, it looks good. It's easy to work if you're, the higher up you are, the easier it is on your back and it easy is to work. So um, what you can do is, uh, the only problem is with this, you, have, you wind up putting a lot more soil in because you have to raise it to that height. And the second thing I don't like about it too, is when you wanna work the soil in there, you have to kind of climb up into it. So I, I recommend raised beds no more than one foot high, 10 inch ideally. Uh, but this is done for presentation. I mean, it looks really great. Uh, it's more like a, a great place to take a walk in and easy to work. It has a nice fence around it. So that, that's a nice garden too. Um, another plan for people who don't have uh, level backyards or if you have uh, like a grade, a grade, you may have to do terrace gardening. So there I have a couple of samples of terrace gardenings as well. Again, what I did was I found a rudimentary pictures and I would find something more involved so you can get a, a kind of a, a, an idea of how it goes from simple to complex. So this one is a very rudimentary one. This one, they just made borders out of whatever they had available. Um, so it starts out with brick here and it goes to wine bottles. Then they did some sort of thatch, but it all contains the soil, helps keep everything from washing away and it creates a nice effect. Um, this one's very rustic. There's nothing wrong with it. And people don't want to put a lot into uh, the, the aesthetics of it. They just want to get the nice plants and produce that they can get out of the garden. Um, a more involved uh, terrace garden is something like this. This is permanent. This is a, a very, really, really here to stay. It's a really beautiful one. It's done with pavers, railroad ties, and the terracing on this one, you can go in with paths. Um, they put chicken wire around to keep uh, any, any pests out, any, any, any animals. And the nice thing about a terrace garden like this, um, it really won't have a deer problem because the deer won't want to climb into the terraces. They're not going to try to get into anywhere that's confined. And deer, to, to, to really get in your garden, deer need a running start because they want to jump over. And here they wouldn't be able to get a running start. So you may have a little problem with squirrels. I don't think groundhogs would even be able to get in or would even venture into something like this. But again, it's, it's there, to, that's a permanent one. It's a lot of time has been put into it and it's really, really a, a nice one. I like that one. Um, another way to go too is whether you're doing an open plan or you're doing a terrace or you're doing um, uh, raised beds, this a, a thing called square foot gardening. And square foot gardening really is taking the space that you have and defining it into sections so you can pl plan what you want to plant in each one foot square. Um, it doesn't mean every one foot square has to change. You may have four squares where you want to put spinach in or you want to put scallions in, but it helps you define your space better and keeps it organized. Now, this is a basic one. They use the raised beds and they put, seems some sort of ribbon tape to kind of define the space. You can take it to the next level where this, where this one shows better um, what you can do with the square foot garden here. Um, typically plants like tomatoes and, and, and these peppers, uh, peppers here, eggplant, they like space in between them. This helps you to really, if you center it, each one plant in a, in a square foot, it gives you the space the plant needs to grow and to get air in between it. And that's what they did here. Um, and then they put a couple of squares with basil, looks like parsley and things like that. And this way it, it's easy. This one's more of a permanent one. They have this uh, weed little border in there. It makes it nice too. Um, so it, that can be done. And, and uh, so, and then we have what uh, the latest craze is pallet gardening. And we all know what pallets are. You can get pallets pretty much anywhere. Oh, uh, out. Yeah. Uh, pa pallets are available in um, mostly if you if you drive by tile stores or uh, certain uh, other stores that have that like uh, even even um, um, greenhouses or places like that or garden centers they usually have a pile of pallets and sometimes they even have a sign say free take it well if you see that take it <laughs> because it's great uh, and the nice thing about pallet gardening is you can it's modular you can move it around the yard it doesn't have to stay in one space you can add to it you can do double layers of it and the, and the other nice thing about it too is that you have your own weed block between the rows the boards block the weeds 
So um, you're only going to have to contend with weeds where the where your crops are growing. Okay. And it helps you define the space. It helps you really put everything in rows, and it works really great. Um, and it's simple. And uh, the boards are not treated, so you're not going to get any hazardous chemicals or any residue from the boards. So it's really a nice way to go. And then there's another picture I have of the raised bed that uh, I like this one. Oh, not raised bed. I'm looking for the uh, the uh, pallet. Um, yeah, the, um, this one. I like this pallet picture. All types of lettuces, and it really lends itself to growing lettuces because it almost becomes like a, a bouquet. And we have curly red oak leaf, curly red leaf. You have romaine here. You have bib lettuce. And the nice thing about it, you can use the board as your guide where to cut it because lettuce keeps coming back. So you just cut it to that level. And then a couple of weeks from now, you'll have the lettuce will all be back again because lettuce likes to keep growing. And uh, so and it's nice. And like I say, it's modular. You can just uh, move it around. You can, um, and if you preserve the wood, which I'll show you later in the talk, how to make a natural wood preserver that will make the boards last just as long as if they were treated chemically um, by using non-toxic uh, ingredients. So those are the types of garden that I have. And I have pictures of my own garden. Before I had the farm, I had a raised bed garden, and I'll show you a couple of photos of that. Um, this is one view, um, and I put four foot by eight foot uh, beds, and I did it for, because of uh, for economics, because lumber typically comes in eight foot lengths. So whether it's two by four, two by eight, or two by 10, they're going to come in eight foot lengths. They'll come in other lengths, but the most common lengths are eight foot. So with, for, if you buy three boards, you can make one box, four foot by eight foot, and that's what I did. And then I put them in. And then what I did, I also, there was a lot of sandstone on the property when we got the house. And so I used all these, these, these pieces of sandstone. I made my own path. I put some sand down and then I just kind of leveled them off. And then again, I put different things in different boxes. Uh, if you want to grow zucchini, unfortunately, the most zucchini you're going to get is two zucchini in one box because they just grow tr tremendously. Uh, and it's all leaves. Uh, so uh, they need room to spread out. But on uh, my other box here, I have tomatoes. And then I have let one box for lettuce, one box for things that like to climb. So I kept it really organized. And then on the other view, is this is good looking the other way. I had one box I put sweet corn in. And I had uh, one box for onions and peppers. So, you know, you don't have to go this extensive. If just having one box or two boxes, uh, it, you'll get enough produce for your family. It's, it's, it's how you plant it. It's how you grow it. Um, so I would always be very meticulous in my planning to make sure that I had enough room for everything I was growing. So those are the different types of gardens um, that basically, I'm sure there are other ones. If you look online, you'll find a lot more. I just took what I thought would be the most helpful. Now, this, the next part of the talk, I want to talk about, OK, what do we grow? Where do we source our seeds? Do we need fertilizer? Um, we'll talk about companion planting. Some people, are there perennial vegetables that I can grow every year? Well, I'll, I'll try to answer these questions as best I can. So what we're going to start first with is uh, sourcing seed. That's the most important thing. Where do I get my seeds from? Um, Okay, here's a, so I came up with, um, since I've been farming, before I started farming, I didn't know any of these places, but since I started, I was either told by other farmers or other uh, greenhouse growers where to really get good seed and to get it at a great price. So uh, the suggested uh, uh, seed and supply sources that we use are, are here, and I'll go over a few of them. Um, the, the, the big favorite is Johnny Seeds, and some of you have probably heard of Johnny Seeds. They're in Maine, and um, they've, been made, they've been producing seeds since 1976. So you can get any kind of seed from them, whether it's a packet all the way up to 50 pounds or 100 pound bag if you're so adventurous. So um, you can do that too. Um, Johnny's is, is great. And all these companies, the thing I like with dealing with them is when you call up to order, you can order online, but I like to make to call uh, to make my order because I can talk to them. If they run out of something, they can su suggest something that's close to it. Um, if I have a question on how to, to, to plant it, how to, how to cultivate it, they can answer all that. 
And they're no more expensive than if you got them at your garden center or you got them at your box store. You can get a packet for four, three, four, five dollars a packet, all the way up to whatever you want, pounds. Um, and their selections are great. And Johnny's, I find to be, in fact, this, growing on our farm, I'd say 90% of the seed we use is from Johnny's. And their germination rates, that's the thing you always want to find out is what's the germination rate? Because sometimes you'll buy a pack of seeds in a store and then you put them in and half will come up. Well, with these people here, they'll have the germination rate right on the package. And, mo and from our experience, it's at least 95% and better. So you, nothing is more disappointing than when you put a, a pack of 25 seeds in the ground and only 12 come up. Well, here you're kind of guaranteed you're gonna get 98% or 23 or at least gonna come up. And that's better. Um, another company that's good is High Mowing Seeds. They're in Vermont. Um, Johnny's is in Maine. Same type of idea. A little more pricey than Johnny's. Um, not as big a selection. Uh, Johnny's also has a lot of tools and a lot of uh, support materials to help your garden better. Uh, insecticides and uh, um, fertilizers, such like that. High Mowing, we, we buy a lot of beans from them. They really seem to have a good peas and beans, that kind of selection. Um, for every gardener, the, what I suggest that every gardener uh, source seeds from is a company called Seed Savers Organization, and they're really terrific. They take seed that, that uh, the heritage and heirloom seeds. So when you buy seeds from them, they can trace the lineage back to almost to its origins. So in some cases, they can trace the lineage back hundreds of years, whether it's in Europe, Asia, this country, North America, uh, you know, wherever, and they'll tell you where the seed first was developed. So if you want a certain type of tomato, let's say a, a Roma type tomato, they'll say, well, this tomato was developed in Italy in 1700, and they've kept the lineage going, or they'll source the seeds and they just keep, you know, they keep breeding them so that you always have a supply. And again, a packet of seeds from them is going to start at about $4, which is great. And uh, you'll have, you can grow crops that nobody else can will be growing because they won't have the great source that you have to find these seeds. And uh, again, good people to work with. And if you join, it's for, I think it's $45 to join the organization. And you get, I think, a percentage off on the seeds. And you also get a magazine, a quarterly magazine from them. And <laughs> you can go out and visit them too. I think they're in Minnesota. And it's a really, really great uh, company to deal with. We get some of our heirlooms from them that are very rare. And, uh, and um, one of the tomatoes that we get from them is called the mortgage lifter. So uh, I suggest if you like a tomato that weighs a couple of pounds that you want to make, uh, you can either slice it or make sauce with it. It's called the mortgage lifter. It's a big red uh, type of brandy wine type tomato, heirloom type tomato. And that was originated in the United States in the 1920s or 30s. And uh, they kept it going. So if you look uh, in their catalog, you'll see it. And we get that, that from them. And uh, it's, it's kind of rare, not everybody has it. And even some of our, our sauce tomatoes we get from them. Uh, other companies that are good, I'm not gonna go into depth on them, they're all good. Fedco Seeds is good. Um, Hudson Valley Seed, very good company. They're right here in the Hudson Valley. I think they just started a few years ago and they have a pretty good selection. I think they're out of Poughkeepsie or Newburgh, one of those towns. Um, if you like to grow um, onions and you like to grow leeks, the place to get your seedlings is from Dixondale Farms in Texas. Everything here is all natural, non-GMO, all these sources. So what Dixondale will do, they'll send you bundles like about like this, bunches of baby onions with the greens on them. So you can buy a bunch, I think it's for 10 or $15, for so about 70 to 100 onions, and they send them to you live in a wax box. And then you, when you plant them, you just soften the soil and just push them into the ground. Uh, to, uh, um, onions don't have to be that deep. In fact, the, the onion growers by us, uh, where they grow, most of the farmers and by us are onion growers. Half of them are sticking out of the ground because you want them to get big and to expand. So you don't want to put them all the way under the ground. And if you don't want to do the seedlings, you can get the um, bulbs for them. And later on, I'll show you the bulbs. Um, <clears throat> plant the little bulbs in the ground and you'll have uh, seed, you'll have to, uh, onions by July, August. And I suggest for gardeners, you can have two, size, two sizes of bulbs, the small ones 
or the, the, the large size. Start with the large size because then you'll get your onions sooner than later. And the onions are great. They have the Vidalia, they have the red onions, yellow or white onions, um, all different kinds of leeks. Um, and it's a really good, a good uh, company to deal with. Um, Harris Seeds is very good. And as far as uh, sourcing tools, a Nolts Produce Supply is really terrific. I can't say enough about these guys. They're Amish company. They're out in New Holland, Pennsylvania, right in the heart of Amish country. I've been there uh, it's about three hours from here, maybe. And they have all, anything you need for gardening, whether it's bins and tools and uh, tomato cages, tomato steaks, twine, rubber bands, any garden tools, um, fertilizers, whatever you need. And the prices are really good. And their shipping prices are really good too. And again, you call them on the phone and you get somebody to talk to and they'll, they'll really take you by the hand. Um, grower Supply is in Connecticut. They're a little bit bigger, uh, not as personal as the other one, but they do have a lot of things, especially if you want to get into greenhouse growing, a small personal greenhouse up to 100 foot, 200 foot greenhouse. And they have all the supplies for for all that, for, 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 for irrigation, for watering systems. Um, again, your basic uh, supplies all the way to the most complicated. And these are, I found these sources to be tried and true. We've used them since we've been, most of them since we've been farming. And uh, if I had known about them when I was gardening, I would have uh, used them as well. So then we go to the next thing uh, I'd like to talk about is what to grow, okay? So, and I divided it up. Again, but these, these lists are what I've come up with. They're no, by no means um, complete. I'm sure I missed a lot of things, but this is what I've over the years developed. And this is what, uh, you know, this is a good starting point. Um, but we have full sun and partial shade crops because that's the most important, the, the biggest question people always ask me is like, why aren't my tomatoes Really, I got a big tomato plant, but I have no tomatoes. Well, it's not getting full sun. So you know, what's going on is the tomatoes are making a lot of leaves to capture as much sunlight as they can, and nothing's going to the fruit. So um, you want to try the ones on the left. When they say full sun, they mean it because they need a lot of sun to really grow well. It doesn't mean they won't grow well. If you have partial three or four hours of sun a day, they may grow okay. But anything less than that, you're going to be you're going to be disappointed. So, um, but if you do have a shady yard, try to at least plant where at least some sun or it gets more light than not. If you really want to plant these things, again, the partial shade and shade crops on the right will grow well in full sun and they'll grow well in in shade. Um, so anything there on, on the, unfortunately it's mostly greens. It's not really like a a uh, fruit type of thing, except for maybe the peas and the radishes, but everything else is like your kales, your spinach, Swiss chard, all, all of them, collard greens, they don't need that as much sun as, as the others do. So you, you'll get a good um, harvest of them, a uh, good crop. So um, th those are the partial and uh, full sun things. And I'm sure, like I said, there's a lot more um, that you can find online by going to different websites. Uh, Farmer's Almanac has a great source for them. I think that's where I got some of this information from them. Um, so you can do that too. And then uh, people always ask me, are there such thing as perennial vegetables and perennials? Uh, yes, there are. It's not as, as great a, a list, but there are things that come up every year. And mostly the, from left to right, the vegetables that are gonna be perennials are artichoke, asparagus, certain types of broccoli, and certain types of spinach. New Zealand is the best one that'll overwinter. Rhubarb will just keep coming. And if you don't watch it, your whole yard will take over your whole yard. It's just like mint, it'll just take over everything. Um, watercress, yam, they're all our perennial vegetables. Um, most herbs tend to be perennial. So if you like to grow herbs, there's a lot of perennial herbs out there. Um, like I say, most of them will keep coming up every year. At the end of the season, cut them back. And then in the spring, you'll send out all new shoots. Fruit, most fruit is perennial because most fruit is trees, trees and bushes. So they tend to be perennials. There's no really annual fruit. It's uh, so 
These are the ones uh, we grow at the farm, uh, raspberries and strawberries. They're easy to grow and they spread out every year. You get more. Um, the raspberries will send up new canes. The, uh, the strawberries will send out new shoots and then they'll root. So you can actually cut them and space them out differently if you want. Um, blackberries, cherries, of course, are trees, currants or bushes. Um, things of that type will just keep growing. Avocado, we can't really grow here, it'll die in winter, but everything else, peaches, peach trees. We have several peach trees at the farm and they're big producers. So um, peach trees are really, they, trees tend to take more, need more maintenance, you know, with pest control and with, with pruning, but you can get really good harvests out of them. Um, so those are the things that, um, these are my choices for perennials. Uh, fruit, uh, vegetables, fruit, and herbs. Then we also have uh, companion planting, which people ask me all the time, what's good ne to plant next to each other? And the reason people do that is, is plants, some certain plants grow well together because they give off different gases that help each other out. It doesn't mean you have to plant them in the same row. You can plant them next to each other. Um, I wouldn't put them you know, interspersed. I would just put one row of, let's say, beets and another, put onions next to it and it'll do, they'll all do well. Um, so the, the thing with uh, like, I'm sure we've all heard the story of like planting sweet corn and then planting pumpkins and melons and squash in between the rows because it'll suppress the weeds and then it can actually climb up the, uh, the corn stalks itself. Depending on the, the, the corn, you wanna have a good corn stalk that's gonna support the weight of these things if they start growing on them. Uh, we had uh, a couple of years ago at the farm, we were growing, um, Cinderella pumpkins, which are small pumpkins, and not in the corn, but next to it. And a couple of feelers got into the corn, and then we noticed that the Cinderella pumpkins were hanging from the stalks. So we were picking corn. We could pick these little pumpkins at the same time. It was just kind of funny to see. Um, but uh, so you can do things like that, and it all works together really well. Um, yeah, so. These are, these are all suggestions. You can research it more. You'll find a lot of information. Um, another thing too is you may want to check the soil. Uh, we're lucky, the Hudson Valley has really good soil. It always did, especially all the bottom land is really good from all the runoff from the hills and the mountains. And it's made some, that's why the early settlers here, and even now you still have some farms that are still in production because the land was always good. So chances are in your backyard, the land is gonna be pretty good. So what you wanna do is do a, a, a soil test. And I recommend, I have this one here called the rapid test soil kit. We use this at the farm and you can use this, you can get this online and Amazon, it's like $20. This thing will last for years. What you do is you put some water and some of your soil in the, the particular test. If you wanna test for pH or for potassium or phosphates, each one does one, one thing and then you add a tablet, mix a little water in it. And then depending on the reading, it'll tell you if the soil is perfect or if it needs some amendment. So uh, when you test the soil in your, in your yard, don't just grab it from one part of your yard, grab it from wherever you're gonna grow, like five or six places, mix it all together. This way you'll get the, a common denominator with the reading and it'll be really good. And then fertilizers, you can get a basic fertilizer. Um, I would not get miracle Grow by any means at all because it's synthetic and it does more harm to the soil than it does good. I would just get a basic fertilizer from my local garden center. I wouldn't even go to a box store to get it because they, they have their own mixes there. They have their own generic uh, brands and they work the best. And for a small gardener, a 10 pound, five pound bag is plenty because you don't want to add too much to it. So you do your test and you see if you're deficient in nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium. So you may want to balance it by putting a, a fertilizer in. And usually a 10-10-10 or a 10-5-10 works the best. Um, they are, that means the percentage that's in the bag. 10% of potash or phosphate or nitrogen is in there mixed with inert ingredients to help spread it. And then uh, this information that I have here, every, every county in, in our country has an ag extension agent, whether you, you have a garden or you're a farmer, you can call them up and they'll help you with any problem. And they're usually attached to a state university. In New York, it's Cornell. 
and in New Jersey, it's Rutgers. So you call, you, if you go to the Cornell website and punch in Ag Extension, it'll take you to that section. And they have a lot of, that's where I got this material. You can get a lot of material on anything with gardening and farming. Um, if you're having problems with pests, you're having problems growing something, uh, soil deficiencies, um, diseases on the plants. They usually have free PDFs of all these things that you can just download and, and read all the information. And if the problem persists, you can actually call the agent for your county and tell them I'm having this trouble and they'll tell you what to do. And it doesn't cost you anything. And it's a great, there's a great wealth of knowledge on those sites. Um, in fact, I got this one from, I think Cornell, and I got this one from, this is a very good one. And I'm going to make these all available to everybody. I'm, go, I'm going uh, to send them, uh, to, and then you can, you know, the library will give them to you, uh, send them to you, anybody who attended today. Uh, this one is a very good uh, um, one. It's a, it takes most of the basic crops that we have that people will grow in their it's three pages. And it tells you what fertilizer will work best, when to apply it, how much you should apply, how to apply it. And this came from Washington State University from the Spokane County Extension Service. And again, it was free information. And this is just this little three piece uh, document is, has a, is loaded with info and, and, and good tips. So these are uh, the things that I like to share with everybody. And as far as uh, local farms in the area, I have a list too of um, local farms that are local to Rockland County, that are local to Bergen County, because those are the closest counties. Um, so I visited all these farms and garden centers. Some of them now are also uh, more into not only being farms, but they're also will sell plants and tools and things of that type. And they're all local. And some of them are in Orangeburg. We have one in Orangeburg. I have this one in Old Tapan. There's, uh, uh, they're, they're, all, they're all over. I think there's still a few in Congers, Dr. Davies Farm. They're all nice places. There are some that I haven't visited, so I didn't put them on the list. But there are ones plenty in, in Bergen County, which is minutes uh, from, from where Palisades and Orangeburg are and, and Tapan. Um, you can go to uh, one of my favorites is just two favorites I have in Bergen County, which is the Old Hook Farm in Emerson, right down uh, Kinder Kamak Road. Um, uh, it, it's been there since, since the 1700s, and I think it's about seven or eight acres, and it's right in the watershed property. So it, the original farmhouse is there, and they grow all organics, and they have beautiful greenhouses, and they have a beautiful farm stand store that's been there since the 1930s, and it's still decorated as such. And that's a great farm. And then the Demery country farm stand is on uh, in Closter, New Jersey. That's been there. I think it's the oldest farm in Bergen County, and it's still in production. And the old Dutch home is still there. And now it's an organization. It's not privately owned, but they grow everything there, and they have a little restaurant where you can go. So these are things I like to share too. And then I like to talk about some um, publications, books, things that you can use to help you uh, that we found helpful. And again, it's not a complete list. This is what I like. There's plenty of other books out there, but these seem to be really, really good and very hands-on. Um, but there's one book, Heirloom, if you like to grow heirloom tomatoes. Tim Stark is probably the premier heirloom grower in on the East Coast, Northern northern east coast anyway in Pennsylvania. All he grows is heirloom tomatoes and hot peppers, and heirloom hot peppers. Um, that's a great book. Then you have another book, Back to Basics, which is good for gardening and homesteading. Self-sufficiency handbook, excellent book for gardening. Um, How to Grow More Vegetables, it's self-explanatory. Um, the New Organic, anything by Elliot Coleman is good. Uh, he is like the guru of, um, of the organic movement. In fact, I think he pretty much started the organic movement in this country in 1965. And he's still around and he still runs his four season farm in Maine. And he has tips on growing it through the winter, growing in the summer, growing all types of year. A really great book that I have too, that's a lot of fun. I have a sample here is the Have More Plan. And this is it. You can get this on Amazon. You can get it online. Um, the book has been in production since 1941. It was written by Ed and Carolyn Robinson, who lived in Manhattan 
and they were tired of the rat race in 1941. So they bought a little homestead in Connecticut, three acres, and they decided to become as self-sufficient as they could. Kept their jobs, but they but they wanted to see how much they could do. So they came up with terrific garden and everything that came out of the garden, they either jarred it, canned it, preserved it. So they really used as much and they even had some egg production, small animal production, but it was really, really a great, it's a great story. And uh, it's, the book is a, a reprint of the original one from the 1940s. And um, it's cost, I think $12 and you can still get it on Amazon, which it's a great book. Um, in fact, it was so popular after the war, after World War II, they gave a copy to every returning GI, got a copy of the book in case he wanted to become a farmer because, you know, jobs were, the war was over and there was all these men come back and there's no jobs. So they figured maybe some of them become farmers. So they gave this book out to them. Um, another a good magazine that I have too is the Backwoods Home Magazine. Uh, this is very good because not only does it show you about gardening, but it tells you what to do with everything you've harvested. So, um, because you're not gonna be able to eat all those tomatoes. You're not gonna be able to eat all this. So you may have to freeze it. You may have to can it. You may have to jar it. You may have to dehydrate it, but they have all tips on that and they have recipes and it's mostly geared towards uh, like the homestead type garden and backyard garden and, and, and it's a quarterly and it's a very good magazine. Uh, countryside and small stock journal is good as well. It's uh, a little more glitzy. I, I like the backwoods better. Um, I have this tool here that my wife got me. She found it online and it's, it's so simple, but yet I think every gardener should have it. And it's called Clyde's Garden Planner. So what is it? It's a slide rule for gardeners. What you do is it pulls out just like a slide rule. And what you do is you, you, can, you can line up the last frost date, which is the red bar, which would, would, would be with the last frost date. I think in, in Rockland County, I'm gonna say it's around now, let's say April, I'm just gonna say April 19th. So, okay, so April 19th is my last frost date. So when is it safe for me to put my tomato plants out in the field? So I go to tomatoes, I line it up, and first planting would be May 17th. So I wanna put my first plants out May 17th, which is typically after Mother's Day, you put your plants out. I like to wait a little longer being north in Orange County, you know, things we have frosts, we, we have had a frost in May, so we have to be really careful. So you do that, then they'll say, okay, then you go to your little check mark. So when can I expect my first tomatoes? Well, July 12th, I'll have my first tomatoes. So you follow this guide with all the popular, he's got all of them listed, everything from onions and peas and spinach and beans and corn and peppers. And he not only tells you that, but he tells you how far to space them apart when you plant them, how deep they have to be, um, how many rows to do. Uh, he just It's just a wealth of knowledge, companion planting. And then when you turn it over to the other side, he has full planting. So you, it works the same way. What's the latest I can put something in that I'll still get something before the winter? So, and it's $6. You go to his website and he has a little video of him explaining how to use it. And it's, he's really, it's a really cool place. He's got a cool little website and uh, for six bucks, I mean, it's really, it's a whole book in a little planner and, and we find it to be really useful. And, and that's what I, I like to, uh, to, to share these things because the, I, didn't, I didn't know about this until um, we call it a, a month ago. So th these are the things that can help your garden to grow really well and have more fun with. Um, so now what I'd like to talk about too is just one more thing about extending the season. A lot of people ask me, how can I keep, keep it going? Or how can I start earlier? Well, what you have to do if you wanna start early, you have to have some sort of uh, cover. You wanna put row covers in to cover your plants out in the field so they don't get damaged by by the weather. Some people use glass frames, some people plastic, um, just regular uh, sheets of uh, plastic uh, and, and like almost like, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, like plexiglass, but you can use something. What we use at the farm is a, row, uh, a material called Agribond. And what Agribond is, it's a material that you drape over your plants in the field 
And we brought some old cheap electrical conduit that we could bend and this way it had its frame to support it. What it does, it helps keep everything about six or seven degrees warmer out in the field. So if at night you put your tomatoes, let's say you put your tomatoes out and, you, and uh, there's gonna be a frost and say, oh, let me just put the row covers on for tonight, it'll protect them. And it will, and I've had friends use it that have had that problem. So even if you wanna start something early, say, you know, I'd like to put my uh, radishes out, but it's a little too cold. Well, then put the row covers on, but just leave the row cover on all day and all night because it'll keep it warmer in, in there, retains the heat and it's translucent. So if you get something that's 80% uh, de 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 dense, uh, it only allows, it only stops 20% of the sunlight from going through. So you're still gonna get 80% of the sunlight, but yet you get that protection. And a roll of this, you can buy it from a tiny roll up to hundreds of feet. It's really inexpensive. And it lasts, as you, what we do when we're done with it, we use it in our greenhouse because we have an unheated greenhouse. And what it does is it, um, we put it down so it keeps everything a little bit warmer inside at night. And it really works because we grow a lot of lettuces. Lettuces like the cold weather, spinach, cilantro, uh, kale, things like that will keep growing cabbage and they'll grow through the winter if you use the row covers. And uh, the material, as long as you take care of it, it's pretty durable. We've had it for five or six years. When we're done using it, we just roll it up, put it in a plastic bag and save it to the next season. And that's what we do with, uh, with the row covers. So what I'm gonna do now is now that I've talked a lot, I wanna show, so I'm gonna stop my screen share. Okay, and uh, what I'd like to do is show um, some of the tools that we use. I was talking about uh, different tools and, uh, and, uh, and now I'd like to depth. So I'm gonna step away, I have to adjust my camera a little bit here. I try to make it that it works in, uh, in all different uh, views. Um, had I been doing this live before we had the pandemic, we used to do this live at the libraries. I bring all the tools with me and then everybody could come and, and, and check them out and see how they work. And some of them are pretty cool. So we're gonna start with the basic one is having a good hoe. There's nothing more important in a garden than having a good hoe. A lot of times, the, a lot of problems, the problem with a good, having a good hoe is when you go to your garden center, Home Depot, they have these big clunky ones that are kind of like a semicircle with a square on it, and they're almost too big. They're good initially to work the soil, but once you have plants in, you don't want to have these, this big thing that's going to, could damage the plants, could get too close to it. So you want to get something like this that has a four inch blade and this does double duty. What it can do is you can work it on the flat to scrape the weeds and break the soil up, or you can use it as a hoe, as a, as a, almost like a little plow when you put it on the side when you wanna make a furrow. And the nice thing about tools like this is it's modular. If this blade breaks, I don't have to go out and buy a whole new armature and handle and the whole thing because it broke. I just replaced the blade. And this is the original blade. We take it off every once in a while, two screws, just to sharpen it on a sharpening wheel. And this has lasted us. We've had this since 2013 or 14, and we use it a lot. And the other thing I recommend too is when you have handled tools, is once a year, give them a good coat of, um, put a rag with mineral oil and give it a good coat of mineral oil. It'll soak in, it'll stop the wood from drying out. Then you don't have to worry about splinters or the handle going bad because the handle is gonna be exposed, exposed to moisture. And, and, and soil and could damage it. So the more you protect your tools and take care of them, the more you, longevity you're gonna get out of them. Um, and then when you're working with small seedlings, let's say you transplanted your little tiny basil plants, you don't wanna be with a big clunky hoe going next to it to break up the weeds. We have something smaller. So we use a, a small one. This is for, for baby seedlings and small transplants because you don't wanna shock the plant or damage it. So you wanna get close to it. So it's kind of offset. So it kind of almost stays away from the plant on its own. And so you want to have at least two size, sizes of hose to use when you're working in the garden. And then for weed control, I like to use a stirrup, a stirrup hose. And this is a great tool because a lot of times people pull the weeds out, but they don't get rid of the weed because they didn't get rid of the root. This gets underneath the root by going, by working it below the soil it'll actually go below the root 
And then when you pull the whole thing out, you get everything. And it's called the styropod because it looks like the styropod of a saddle. Um, and again, same thing. If this blade goes bad, four screws, a new blade, like everything else, you, get, you keep the same armature, you keep the same parts. Uh, but again, this is original. We've never had to replace it. And this is, in a sense, it comes in larger. If you have a bigger garden and you want a larger one to work a larger area or a smaller garden, it comes in different sizes. I think this is a five inch one. They have them down to three inches and maybe as big as eight inch. So you just can scrape it and break the soil up, pull your roots out. So these are the kind of tools that I recommend. Um, now, when you're planting, a lot of the, we found a way to plant that's real easy, and, and, and this is really great. And uh, by using little jab planters, okay? A jab planter is just like the name says, you jab it into the ground. Now, this one we got from a company in uh, Pennsylvania. It's called the Stand and Plant. I think you can see the logo here, Stand and Plant, because the name says it all. You're standing while you're planting. You don't have to get down into it and, uh, and, and you know, dig your furrow and then drop your seeds in and backfill it. You use the jab planter, how it works. It has a little handle here that you squeeze. I'm trying to get to the camera here. You squeeze, squeeze this. Well, what does it do? It opens up a little door at the bottom where the seed's going to come out. So what you do is you take this planter, you jab it in the ground, you drop your seed, you open the little door, you go straight up, you walk to the next one. And then what happens is it backfills the hole because the soil is soft. You don't have to, and if you want to, you can always just go with the rake over it after. But you can get a rhythm going. You have a little bag with your seed. You just drop the seed, you know, jab it, drop the seed, lift the door, lift it up, go to the next one. See how fast you can plant, as fast as you can get a rhythm going, you can just do it. And you can do this for little seedlings, seeds, or even those onion sets I was talking about, you drop the little seedling onion in and you can plant it like that. Um, uh, you can go to his, I'll, I'll include the link to the video. I'll send it to Emily and she'll, she can send you everything. Um, and you can watch them actually work with it. And it's really good ideal for, and for any type of seed. People ask me, well, what about lettuce and radishes? The seeds are so tiny. Well, just grab a little pinch and just drop the pinch in, same thing. And the nice thing when you plant radishes, you don't want to plant one at a time. You want to pull, well, you want to plant the whole bunch. So what you do is you plant them, throw about 10 or 15 seeds, a little pinch full, and then you'll have the whole bunch of radishes. So when you go to pick them, the whole thing comes out and there's all your nice radishes on a plate, pick one at a time. So we use this to plant sunflowers, to plant corn, to plant um, any type of beans, and it works really, really well. And we just walk down um, the row and we just jab it in. The nice thing too, laterally, you can work and do multiple rows because it reaches, it's four foot. So you could do four or five rows at a time, depending on what you're planting. And then to go along with it, we have a larger one for actual seedlings. We got from the same company. A little background on the company. Uh, the man who makes it, his name is Frank Oliver. He's a dairy farmer outside of Pittsburgh. And in the winter, he has this shop and he builds these tools to, uh, he sells them directly. You can't get them anywhere except from him. Um, and his prices are good and his shipping, he doesn't charge for shipping. And they build them in the shop in the winter when there's not much to do. So uh, we use these too. He, um, this is a, a jab planter for actual plants. So if you want to plant your marigolds, for anything from your marigolds to your tomato plants, to your um, pepper plants, zucchini, whatever, eggplant, any plants that are uh, uh, seedling size that come in the sets that you buy at the garden center, well, this will plant them. And I'll show a little video on it uh, after. So what this does, this, this, this thing is the same concept as the other one. You has a, a handle that will open the door. Of course, the door is much bigger than the one on the other one. Three inches, I think it's more than three inches. So what you do with this one, same thing, I'm gonna step back. So you just jab it into the ground. It goes down about four inches, five inches. You drop your seedling in, you pull the handle, lift it up, and it's planted. You go to the next one, drop, open the door, go to the other, lift straight up. So you can plant your tomato plants and pepper plants and even flowers in, in minutes. Uh, and, you, and most time you don't have to backfill it because the soil will fall back into place, especially if the soil has been worked and it's nice and soft. 
So this is a, a really, really good tool. If you're doing a lot of work, if you have a small garden, of course you can do it by hand, but if you have a larger garden and you wanna make it easier to, to plant easier on your back, this is the way to go with something like this. Um, so we, we use that. Um, another way too, if you wanna take a furrow, there's a great tool called the zipper. And this works just as well. Why is it called the zipper? Because this side is a plow. And what you do is you plow, you open up your furrow with, with, this, with, with this end up, so you'll actually drag it on the soil. So what it does is opens up the furrow and puts the soil on both sides. Then you drop in your seeds, then you flip it over, and then you, it pulls the soil in from both sides and covers the hole. So you would just scrape, you would just scrape the whole thing, put your seed in, turn it over, and go back over, and it fills in from both sides. We use this at the farm to plant garlic. Uh, when we do garlic, uh, we found that um, by making a big furrow uh, and then dropping the little cloves in, and then by just coming back and just going over it, it's great. And it takes only minutes to do. But again, again a tool like this, is, 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 it helps anything that can make the job more fun than to be tedious, because you, know, you don't want gardening to be tedious, you want it to be fun. Uh, some people like to start plants themselves. One of the questions I always get is like, is I, I tried to start my own tomatoes, but they didn't come out well, they wouldn't germinate properly. That's because you have to have, the heat source has to be constant, whether it's in a greenhouse or in a house. If you're trying to germinate plants and during the day it's 60 or uh, let's say 70 degrees, then now you turn the heat down because you went to sleep. Well, that's going to affect the plant growth. It's, they have to have constant uh, heat. So I recommend if you want to start a few flats of your own plants, whether it's lettuce, tomato, whatever it is, get yourself a little heat mat. And then the heat mat, you can put a couple of flats on the heat mat to have the picture. And it keeps it like 80 degrees until they germinate and get to a certain size. Uh, you just keep it on all the time. And, and it shuts off by itself. It's a, it's a mat. You can put a couple of whatever, however your plants are in little pots or whatever, it'll keep the heat on them and keep it constant and it rolls out. It's enough to do a, a lot of plants. This is like $30 and, and uh, we used to use it, but we don't use it, you know, when I had the, when I had the garden, I was using it, but not at the farm, we, we don't, but it's simple and it's, it's easy. It's a good tool to have. Um, a lot of people ask me about questions about pest control. What do I do about insects? I don't want to use anything that's harmful to the environment or to myself if I ingest it. Um, we use this spray here called Monterey Garden Insect Spray. And uh, it's, it's natural, it's organic, it's OMRI certified. Um, it, it kills a whole uh, plethora of, of different kinds of bugs, but, but it doesn't harm the bees or it doesn't harm ladybugs or bugs of that type but it'll get rid of your potato beetles, mites, uh, cucumber beetles, and it, um, the borers for um, corn borers, um, the worms or caterpillars, whatever the harmful ones are that get on the horn cattle, the ones that get on the tomatoes. And it's very good and a little goes a long way. This is a quart because we use it at the farm, but in a garden you can get a pint and uh, that'll last seasons because you mix it with uh, gallons of water. Um, another thing that, that I recommend too is when you, when you use it, when you use the uh, uh, Monterey, especially if you're using it for squash, uh, because they have those borers that get into the root and then the plant looks like it's running out of water and it's drying out while the root being eaten from the inside out, is when you plant your zucchini, whether it's a seedling zucchini or if it's a seed, when you make the hole, spray a little bit in the hole, then put the seed or put the seedling, cover it, spray a little bit around. That'll prevent them from even coming there. They'll be, they won't like the, uh, you know, the, they'll know it's a poison, so they stay away. And it's not uh, harmful to the environment or to people. This one's called uh, Monterey. There's another one, Pyrethium, that you can use too. It's good to mix them once in a while because the pests, believe it or not, they get wise to it or they build up immunities to it. So then you switch to another natural one and then they get all confused. So this is a good spray to use. Uh, you can even use it on fruit trees. It's really great. So these are the things that we do. And I've learned this along the way. I mean, I'm no, 
I'm not a real, uh, you know, I've learned by, by just reading and doing and talking to other people. I'm not a, um, you know, I'm not like a wizard on this stuff. I, I just want to impart what I've learned. And if I can help people to do that, uh, you know, then I've accomplished my, my mission. Um, also, one other thing I like to talk about is too, like watering. Um, you, if you have a small garden, you don't have to do a watering system. You don't have to do a, a drip system or anything like that. You can just get what we use in our greenhouse. We have simple timers. Um, you can get a simple timer and put your hose on the timer. And this is a good one. You can This one, you just program it to do once a day, once every other day, once a week. And just hook the hose on one side and the outlay on the, you can use either the oscillator or the one that spins. And this way it takes, if you set it for a particular time every day, you don't have to worry about it. It works on a couple of batteries and the batteries last all season. And it's, um, it's made by a company called Nelson and they've been doing this a long time. Uh, and uh, this works really well. And they're waterproof, which, which is really good. They're sealed. And it's a good way to, to, to do it. So, so these are the uh, things. I have another one more book I'd like to share, and I'll put this in the uh, because it pertains to the Hudson Valley. My wife found this book for me a few years ago. Success, can you read that? Success with Small Fruit by E.P. Rowe. E.P. Rowe was from Cornwall, New York. He was a writer, but he loved growing all types of fruits, uh, fruit uh, from raspberries, strawberries, blueberries, and he would travel all around the Hudson Valley to sample them, to see what other farmers were doing. He grew them all himself too. And this book was originally written in 1880. And this was the 1902 reprint. And now I said, you know, let me look it up online and see if they still do it. You know, I went on Amazon. It's still in production in paperback. You can get it without any problem. And he talks about this whole area. He'll talk about Rockland County. He'll talk about Bergen County, uh, close to Dock Road, going down the farmers, bringing everything to go into New York City. And it's a great book and you can get the reprint of it. He has illustrations. In fact, we use his method when we plant our strawberries. We follow his method for how to lay the roots out when you plant strawberry plants. And every year we add a few more, we get a hundred more um, seedlings to put uh, strawberries in. And you have to fan the roots out a certain way. And there's a little crown that you leave just above the surface when you put the soil in. And then the, this way the, uh, they take really well. So um, these are things that, and every day you learn something new. You know, I'm always looking for, for information and, and talking with people too. So you learn how to do it. So that's my little presentation. If anybody has any questions about anything, I'll try to answer whatever I can. If I don't know it, I'll try to find out for you or you know, I can direct you where to someone who will know. Mm. Tony, Gail had a question in the chat about using horse manure for fertilizer. Oh yeah, horse manure is great. It's a great fertilizer. Just don't use, like any uh, manure, don't use a lot. I mean, a little goes a long way. And there's nothing wrong with cow manure, horse manure, pig manure, they all work great, you know? They're all equally good because they all eat grass and that's what you're getting. You're getting the grass back in another, in another way, you know, with, the, with all these nice minerals and uh, nutrients in it. So yes, absolutely. Uh, Hal is wondering if uh, you ha would like to show off any of the hand tools in the toolbox behind. Oh, sure, I can show a few things. You know, I'm glad you asked me that. No, anyway, what I would say is, there's a, a lot of hand tools. Let me just move this out of the way. They're simple tools. Um, let me move this. Also, one more thing I forgot to mention. If you want to get a good rake, get a wide rake. The rakes that you get that are one foot wide, they're good. But when you're working a, a garden in a bed, you want to get a nice wide rake. It makes your job go quicker. And it handles extra long, so you can really get in there more. And so we use these broad rakes. And especially if you're in a raised bed, they're two feet wide, so I only have to make two passes rather than a bunch of little passes. So it makes it a lot of fun. Yes, the hand tools. Um, it's, it's good that you asked me that question. We have the things to put bulbs in the ground where you wanna put a large bulbs for flowers. You can just jab it, make a hole and uh, just drop the plant in. So we have that. Um, I have uh, weed scrapers. There's, let me see what I have here. Some of them are stuck. 
We have shovels. Let me just get some celery. These are small um, tools that we use. This is a nice, just a small hoe. So if you're down working low and can you see, oh, if you're down low working in the garden and you want to make a little furrow and a little and scrape some weeds, these are really nice. These are uh, from, uh, this is, these are Japanese. This is what the Japanese gardeners and farmers use and it works really well, Korean too. So these are like oriental tools that have been around for thousands of years. So it's really good and they still make them. So we use something like this when we're working in the greenhouse. You also have weed scrapers. See, there's a weed scraper. There's a company in Harrison, New Jersey. I don't know if anybody can see this. It says the name of the company, if you can read it. C.S. Osborne and Company. These tools are made here in Harrison, New Jersey. For the, they've been in business for 200 years. They make mostly upholstery tools, okay? I'm going to sit so everybody can see me. They make upholstery tools as their main thing. Um, they started in Newark for the first hundred years they were in Newark, then they moved across the river into Harrison and they're in this old foundry building. And uh, I've been there and they still make the tools the old fashioned way. And they're all made here. They make shovels and they have everyone has a number, a different number for what it is. They make asparagus cutters to cut the asparagus. And I said to them, they should promote, I said, you don't, you guys don't promote your garden tools. You're talking all about uh, upholstery tools all the time. You should do more with the garden tools. And they do have a few distributors too, but they don't sell directly to the public. But if you wanted to buy them from them, you'd have to get a bunch of people together and maybe you can get a box of shovels, but they'll give them to you at a wholesale price. And they're all made here. This is what's called a dibbler. A dibbler is a way to make a, a an individual hole in the ground if you're going to drop a, a bulb in or a, or a small onion. Uh, so they make these too, and they even have another ver version that's all aluminum. So they have an aluminum one, and they have one that's half wood. And these are just for making uh, holes to put little uh, plant plugs in or little seedlings or even small flowers. So they make all these. And the company, I, I went to visit them one time and I, I thought I was walking into like 1930. Everything was like the offices were set up old fashioned. The lights are old fashioned. They had the, they even had in the back, the furnaces going where the guys were making stuff by hand. I'm like, wow, then I stepped into a time machine here. So these are basically the tools. What you also want to have is a good, um, a good, um, you want to have a good clipper for cutting roots and stuff back. So you get yourself a nice pair of snips like this. You know? This is good to have if you're doing pruning your uh, blueberries or you're pruning your uh, raspberries or your strawberries. It's always good, it's nice to have a nice little set of snips. Uh, and garden snips are, are different than others than as heavy duty. So you want to get something that like that that works. So that's basically what I have in my bag of goodies here. And uh, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, this is uh, when we cut lettuce at the farm, whether it's head lettuce or cabbage, this is a cabbage cutting knife. We use this and it really works. It cuts the whole head right off. Uh, so there are specific tools with sp specific things, you know? And this box was, uh, actually my father was a carpenter. This was a screw box. He had all different screws in here. So now I use it for tools. So that's what we have in there. <laughs> We have a question from Kathy, who's wondering what she can do about a groundhog problem. And are there any solutions besides just trapping? Um, um, groundhog, does she have a border around her uh, yard, uh, like a, a fence or a border? That, uh, or is it just open? That's what I'd need to know, because if she has a border around it, what she would have to do is go below the surface, maybe down a foot and put some sort of netting or, or, or some sort of screen so that they can't get through. Um, and again, you have to have a certain height. They're gonna get through. They climb, you know, too. That's the bad part about them. Um, they're very persistent. Um, the only thing is you can do live trapping and then bring them somewhere else. I have a friend that does that. He gets them and he takes them to the park. <laughs> 
So, I, uh, but I, I need to know what type of layout she has so before I could really answer that. Yeah, she says she has a high fence, but okay. has problems with uh, both climbing and digging. Yeah, yeah. See, digging is they're going to they prefer to dig. So what we did at the greenhouse, we we dug down about a foot and we put um, what do you call it? Uh, a garden cloth underneath and it's this really really strong material and we draped it down below and then we came out and this is about a foot below the surface so then we we uh we covered it so then when they start digging they keep hitting this cloth and then they realize they can't get further but the cloth is really really strong material and they can't get through it so but we had to go down about a foot to do that and come out not only go down but we had to come out too so this way if they start digging a little further away from the from the edge they 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 figure oh we'll get in this way but then they hit that and they keep hitting it and then they don't get in as far as getting over the fence how high is the fence you know you may have to go up to like six foot to keep them out see that's where it gets tough because then you have to put fencing uh, there are deterrents but nothing really works for groundhogs it's really tough um you know you could try hot pepper spray on the plants that might deter them a little bit um, there's a product out there called deer scram that you can put around the border of your garden and it's made with dried blood. So they get the scent of a predator and then they don't want to come in because they think there's predators around. You could try that too. It comes in a tub. It's not expensive. It's a, you just spread it around the garden and that might, you could try that. It's called deer scram and it works for deer. So I don't know how it'll work on groundhog. Groundhogs are the toughest thing out there. They're just very persistent. Um, I have a friend of mine in town, I live in Cedar Grove, who runs the Morgan's farm and they have one acre that they're farming. He spends more time trying to, to keep the, the groundhogs out. He's got so many levels of fences and things and nets and, and they still get in, you know, no matter what he does, you know, so it's, it's a tough one. Hal reminded us that you had said that you would talk about wood preservatives. Well, yes, I'm glad you said that. Okay. What I did was I'm going to split my screen again, share the screen so I can go back to that. Uh, let me share screen. Um, let's go into this one, share. Okay, let's go to uh, Okay. This, this, this uh, page that I'm showing here has shows two things. Um, when I first started my garden in, in uh, Nutley, I, the soil there was all, was all clay. So I had to dig it all out. It was maybe one inch of topsoil. So I came up with this. This is good for people who have really bad soil. Um, this is what I started with for a four by eight box by 10 inches high. I did a mix of all this together and this was enough to fill one box. Eight, pound, eight bags of topsoil, three bags of compost, 40 pound bag of cow manure. See, I only need one bag, don't use too much. And about three feet of cubic feet of peat moss. Mixed it all together and that filled one box. And then every year I would just augment it with a little soil. If I had any loss from pulling plants or um, uh, wanted to enhance it, I, I mostly I would put my own compost in. But once I did that, it was a great way to start off. Below that is the board preservation mix. Uh, you don't want to get treated lumber. They even have bio-treated lumber now, but it's still a series of chemicals and you really want to stay away from that. So what I found, and I found this, I think on PBS or one of the garden shows, I think it was Victory Garden, board preservation mix. You use three parts of clean strip. It's a green odorless mineral spirit made of uh, denatured alcohol from trees. And then you put one part of boiled linseed oil in there and mix it all together. So three parts, three to one mix. And then what you do is you get a roller and a rolling pan, just like you were painting, and then you just apply it to the boards. Do it like three coats. The first coat is just going to soak right in, and it's going to look like the board is dry already. Wait uh, maybe a few hours, do it again, then wait till the next day and do it again. And you put three coats on this, it'll last just as long as treated lumber um, and without any, any toxins or any carcinogens. Uh, there. And it really, really works. We used it in our greenhouse. We've had, then in the greenhouse, they're exposed to a lot of conditions, heat, moisture, uh, cold, and we're only starting to replace the boards now. And they've been there since 2010. We, you know, so, uh, and they're only starting to get rotted where they meet contact with the soil, 
And uh, but that's why you, well, you want to give it those extra coats, and that'll last really long. And it's a really good way to to do it, safe and clean. So I hope that answers that. Let me stop the share. Can you just uh, say a little bit more about the type of mineral oil you're recommending there? Oh, it's just linseed oil. That's it. Linseed, boiled linseed oil. That's it. And and mineral spirits. You just want. You could use a denatured alcohol, something that's going to break down the because the linseed oil is going to be thick. So you want something to make it thin so it permeates into the wood. So you can use a, a denatured alcohol or a natural mineral spirit, um, which is pretty much the same thing. And you just do three three parts of. Uh, of the, the alcohol to one part of the mineral, the, the, uh, the linseed oil. And then just so if you're doing, a, so it'll be one, so let's say you wanna make a gallon of it. So three quarts of mineral spirits or denatured alcohol and one quart of uh, the, the uh, boiled linseed oil, and that'll do it. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Well, can you show like, uh, anyone wants to put anything else in the chat? I will make sure to get all the uh, the handouts from Tony. I know they were a little bit hard to uh, read, so we'll be, make sure to uh, get those out to you later. Yes. Oh, so uh, was, uh, wanting to see the uh, the garlic planting tool again. Uh, the garlic. Uh, which one was that? Which. Is that the shorter yeah. red one you said that you could use for planting garlic? Oh yeah, that was the white one. You could do this. You could do this okay. for planting. You can use um, where is that? Where did I put it? Oh, it's right here. This one. This one can plant the bulbs uh, and the gar and the garlic and the onions. This can do onion seedlings, garlic seed. That's what I wanted to show everybody too. If everybody likes to get onions, okay, let me show you. I brought this in. We we're planting our onions um, starting on Saturday. We get bags, we get bushel bags of the onions. And I just wanted to show one bushel bag of onions. This is seed onion, these are onion seedlings right here. This is 32 pounds of onions, right here. Can everybody see that? 32 pounds of onions, onion seedlings, okay? okay? So what you do is you dig a hole and then you drop them in, and some of them are already making the greens already. The nice thing about this, if you have a bunch of friends and you all have gardens and you want to do it, if you went to the garden store and bought a pound of these, they'll cost you $4 for a pound. This 32 pound bag cost me $22. So 67 cents a pound. So you get three or four people together. And I got this from Nolts. I ordered them from Nolts. And they, 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 they are they're organic onions that come from Dutch Valley growers in La Crosse, Indiana. So what we'll do is we have a way of planting them. Instead of using the individual um, one at a time method, we have this tool here, which is a, a, a wheeled dibbler. So this thing, actually what we do is we just put it on the ground and it puts a, makes a hole every three inches. And we just drop one onion in, in each hole. So this way we get the job done good. And the nice thing about a dibbler like this is that you could take some of these spikes off and if a plant calls for different spacing, you take every other one out. So then six inch spacing, then eight inch spacing, then it goes all the way to, if you just leave one in, it makes like a four foot spacing. So it's good, it's really good, but that's more for what we would use at the farm. Or if you're a big, you have a big gardener and very adventurous, you can do it too. And uh, so we find all these tools. So this is what, so the onions, we get our red onions, our yellow Vidalias and our white onions. So, um, and these are already going. You can see they have all the greens coming out already. So we'll start planting these on Saturday and we'll, uh, get them all in the ground. So, but again, it's a great way to do it because you get a head start rather than using the tiny bulbs. So, so that's what we use, and that's how you do it. Oops, okay. All right. Looks like we have one last question. Uh, sure. Regina asks, when is the best time to plant lemon seeds? Lemon seeds. For what, what, uh, what, what they're actually planting a lemon tree. I'm not sure what they're talking about. Uh, that, that's all I got here. <laughs> yeah, because lemon, uh, you, you'd have to, lemon, first of all, lemon trees wouldn't grow around it. They would, because they're, they're more of a, they need warm weather constantly, unless you're doing them indoors, then you could plant at any time. Um, I don't know if they mean lemon grass or lemon, actual lemons. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I wouldn't know, you know, a lemon tree, unless you're growing it in a greenhouse or indoors, you could plant it anytime. It doesn't have a particular time. It's not a seasonal tree. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And thank you so much, Tony, for your presentation. This was excellent. And we'll be sure to get all the handouts from you so that we can pass those on to everyone. Yes. And I'll send the information about the book. I'll send uh, whatever uh, about the stand and plants. If anybody wants those, I really recommend. I mean, for the money, you can't go wrong. Uh, you know, the, the thing with uh, unfortunately, most gardeners tend to be older. We want to just like, we don't want to really bend down that much, you know, so you want to use tools that can make your job easy and, and anything that can make it more fun and helpful. So I'll include the links to that, Clyde's Garden Planner, the EP Row Book, whatever else I can throw in there. The thing about where to get the test kits, um, whatever else. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, they want to email me, Emily, give my email address to everybody. It's on my email it'll be on the email so they don't want anybody want to ask a direct question and of course um the, anybody wants to come to the farm you're all welcome to come visit the farm <laughs> see what we're doing <laughs> yeah. okay well thank you so much everyone and i hope everyone has a fabulous day and we will see you again soon great terrific <laughs>